Okay, hello, I am Dewitt Wesson, the Community Relations Associate here at Eljoya Thornton Place. Um, before we start today's presentation, I'd like to share a little bit about our beautiful community. Eljoya Thornton Place is a premier retirement community located in North Seattle, featuring spacious, elegant apartments, exquisite Quincy cuisine, sorry, uh, currently being delivered to, uh, actually being delivered or in our, um, being eaten in our restaurant right now and robust, meaningful life enrichment activities to keep our residents engaged, entertained, and connected. Additionally, our tranquil and well-maintained outdoor courtyard and the Thornton Creek walkway are uh, perfect for visiting with friends and family during this time of social distancing. If you are interested in learning more, our community relations team would be happy to answer any questions um, or take you on a tour of our community by request. Uh, we can be reached at 206-306-7920. And now for our main event, uh, we are honored to host Dr. Karen Redding, who will be presenting on nutrition and exercise tips for, op for achieving optimal health. Uh, Karen Redding, a nurse epidemiologist, is a faculty member at the University of Washington, where she conducts research in lifestyle interventions of diet and exercise. Uh, take it away, Karen. Thank you. Appreciate the introduction. I'm going to share my screen. If I can. Let's see. All yours. Great. Okay. Are you seeing my slides? Oops. Did it look funny to you on the, did it go green? <laughs> it looks a little. Yeah. Off. I don't know. I'm going to try again because it, Started off fine, but then went to green. I've not seen that happen before. Let's try that. At least I wasn't just seeing things. It sounds like you saw it too. <laughs> okay, let's try. How is that? That looks good. Okay, well, hope that stays then. Um, well, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate um, the opportunity to provide this presentation. And um, thank you for taking the time to be here and to those of you who watch this afterward. Um, so like um, DeWitt was saying, I'm happy to take questions as I go. So if you'd like to type it in the chat, sometimes as I'm sharing screen, it's hard to multitask and watch the chat. So DeWitt, if you see anything come up in the chat, um, just let me know and I'm happy to answer those as I go. I also am going to pause um, at the middle point. So after I talk about the, um, the dietary component, I'll pause there and ask if people have questions before I move on to the physical activity part. Um, so that's another um, spot where if you wanted to ask a question and I can check in to see if there are any questions at that point. So um, first really we have to ask the question, um, what is, optimal health? Um, how do we define it? I routinely ask this of my students at the University of Washington, where I teach in both the School of Nursing and in the School of Public Health. And I'm always impressed by their answers. Um, you know, they talk about not only the absence of disease, which um, as Dewitt said, I'm an epidemiologist by training. And so we often think about measuring diseases, but really it's health is not just the absence of disease, but also the ability to achieve the lives that we envision for ourselves, um, which allows us maybe to be our fullest selves. Um, and that can encompass the ability to do things that we want um, and need and care about, um, you know, care about in our lives. So this really, this idea of optimal health is set at the individual level. It takes into account each person's level of functioning and desires and orientation to the world. And so for one person, it could mean achieving a life um, that is, you know, where they're able to enjoy outings with their family. For another, it could mean you know, something like um, training for a half marathon. Um, so it's, it's up to the individual and we really then play a role in setting what optimal health means to each of us. And in that sense, it's really more than the absence of poor health or the absence of diseases, but rather about having a level of health that allows us to live our fullest lives. Now that's also admittedly gotten harder with the COVID pandemic, um, because what we're able to achieve is sometimes, um, have to be redefined. You know, it, it 
may have shrunk our world a little bit. And, and so um, there are some challenges in relation to optimal health, as well as to diet and exercise when we think about how COVID has changed the world for us. But um, I'm also happy to take Q and A's um, uh, and you know, talk about how we can try to remain um, in that stage of seeking for optimal health, even amidst COVID. So uh, let's see, next um, question is, what evidence then exists that there is an optimal diet and exercise for seniors? So, you know, really um, this second question is asking not only what, what do we think, um, you know, people should do to have the healthiest life, but what evidence is existing? And this is similar to how I orient this at my courses as a professor at the UW. Um, you know, and basically it, it is helping students to see here are the guidelines and where did that data come from or what was the um, data that um, was um, contributing to that. So how did the guidelines form as they do. So as a nursing researcher, I often approach this type of question using then a systematic approach that evaluates the evidence that's currently currently available. So today I'm going to talk through that evidence. And for one of my classes at UW, we talk a lot about where we get our data. So for example, the Seattle Times, that might be where we first come across something. And then we dive into the research literature behind that. So I'm, that's kind of how I've oriented this um, today too. So as I said, I'm going to talk about dietary intake. So the question is, how do we make a decision about what diet is best for us? And I bring this up um, because from the Seattle Times, there was an article and it said the latest chapter in the low fat, low carb debate. And it's basically gave the advice to not get caught up in my diet is better than your diet mentality. But it, it really, um, even just in the caption of this picture says a focus on the food quality is more important when it comes to promoting good health and reducing disease risk. And that really was the summary from the research article um, that was um, underlying as the foundation for this. So we do need to acknowledge that the, a person's dietary intake is complex. And so we start by thinking about the components of, of the diet that we eat. And then, you know, basically from the literature, we, we see that there are things like, um, you know, macronutrients and micronutrients. So the macronutrients are the, the fats and the carbs. Um, and so that's informing this question in the title of the Seattle Times article. Um, saying, you know, in the low fat, low carb debate, do we know which is better? And then we can also think about the nutrients in our food. So the micronutrients, such as the vitamins and minerals. And then also we can think about um, the, um, the quality of the calories that are consumed. So as I talk today, I'm going to provide an overview of what experts in the field think on how to create an optimal diet. And, and one thing that was really cool as I read the Seattle Times article um, that was written up in the Seattle Times um, also about this article, it talked about Dr. Marion Newhauser, who is a Seattleite and a, um, a researcher at both the University of Washington and Fred Hutch. So this was informed by some work um, that they did to talk about dietary quality. So this review article that Dr. Newhauser from University of Washington um, contributed to focused on, um, you know, what we just talked about was um, optimal health. And rather than focusing on optimal health, the review article actually focused on reducing the risk of disease. And, you know, that being a, a different way of conceptualizing um, uh, a person's health, but the absence of multiple diseases. So the types of diseases that they were interested in looking at were like heart disease and cancer and diabetes. So some pretty common um, diseases. And so that article focused on how do we reduce um, our risk of those in order to achieve optimal health. And really it came down to that the quality um, of the food was more important than the quantity of the food that was consumed. So it was focusing on um, um, fat and carbohydrate intake um, mostly. And it made the, the review article also had a catchy title and it said dietary fat from foe to friend. 
And really, I think that helped to um, show that in the research literature, there has been a transition where we have looked at types of, um, of fat and thought in some you know, eras that um, all fat was, was needed to be reduced. And then we realized as time went on that there was maybe a more nuanced example. So when we think about the quality of the fats, um, this research article dove into that. And so what this um, research article showed was that trans fats were particularly harmful to achieving optimal health. So we'll take a moment to look at what's taking place in this figure. And essentially what they're doing is they're plotting um, on the horizontal axis the um, increment of energy from fat. So the more a person eats of that particular fat is along the um, horizontal axis. And then if we look at the vertical axis, that's the change in the total mortality. So the risk of death um, in relation to eating that type of specific fat. And what you see is, and this is why the caption of this slide really points out trans fats, is that a person, if a person is increasing the amount of trans fats as a proportion of their um, of energy from fat, that is leading to an increased risk of mortality. We also see that increased risk um, associated with saturated fat, but really to a lesser degree. And then we see the converse for monounsaturated fat, we see a reduction in risk of mortality the more a person is eating monounsaturated fat. And then for polyunsaturated fat, that's actually the um, largest um, decrease we see is from polyunsaturated fat. So Basically, um, for trans fats, the risk is 20% higher for 2% for more trans fats in the diet. Um, and this was data that are from a really large study. So um, Harvard has run a nurse's health study and a physician's health study. And from that study, there were 126,000 men and women that were followed for up to 32 years with assessments every four years. So in terms of epidemiologic data, that's a pretty solid data set um, to be making these, um, uh, you know, to be uh, informing these results and then making the conclusions from. So the next thing is that it actually then um, begs the question, which foods contain trans fats and which foods contain polyunsaturated fats? Well, highly processed foods like refined grains and added sugars, things you know in the um, interior of the of the aisles of the grocery store where um, there's crackers and and things, um, that's where you're going to see more of the processed foods that will likely contain or are more likely to contain trans fats than others. And notably, though, trans fats have been um, a source of FDA regulation so that the Food and Drug Administration has been trying to limit the number of trans fats and has banned them in the United States. But there are still um, some small amounts of trans fats that can get in because the FDA reduced it to um, less than half a gram per serving. And so one of the ways foods have been sneaky about this is they have increased their number of servings so that they might say per serving there's less trans fats, but that trans fats aren't entirely gone. So the suggestion to replace highly processed foods with the unprocessed foods of carbohydrates like non-starchy vegetables um, and whole fruits and legumes. So eating um, more whole foods like you know broccoli and um, carrots and um, fruits like apples and, and beans rather than the more interior aisles of processed foods. So um, we see then that cooking with oils such as olive oil, which contains higher amounts of monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats is an ideal um, way to achieve those monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. Okay, so this diet is really consistent then with the Mediterranean diet. And um, in the Mediterranean diet, you may be familiar with it already, but there's a focus on eating a wide array of fruits and vegetables, unsaturated fats through um, olive oil, and eating foods that are minimally processed with a variety of proteins in the forms of fish, which has um, better fats than, um, 
than trans fats or um, and better fats than um, uh, meats or chicken. And so the suggestion of eating um, fish and seafood as well as legumes and nuts as a way of achieving our improved quality of, of fats. And so, and then also there are some meats and sweets. Those are together at the top and basically saying from this pyramid, eat those in smaller doses than you're eating the fish, um, seafood, and then the veggies. And you notice that the grains are whole grains in here, but are also just one component of um, the unprocessed fruits and vegetables that is being encouraged to be eaten in sort of whole ways rather than in processed ways. So um, I'm happy to go over that a little bit more in detail during the Q&A too, if people have questions. So interestingly, um, this was corroborated by a popular press review that was conducted by the US News and World Report. So I don't know, um, from where I sit, I'm in academia, I'm used to seeing the US News and World Report um, provide rankings of you know, the, the best program for nursing, which University of Washington just uh, tied for first place for our bachelors of science in nursing. So that's exciting. Not <laughs> um, but that's usually how I orient myself to US News and World Report rankings. I hadn't actually realized that they, they ranked diets as well. And so at first I was a little bit skeptical, I will admit. Um, because I hadn't really thought of this as a typical source for diet advice, um, but I actually was pleasantly surprised when I read about how they went about determining, you know, their list of rankings of diets. Um, so their best diets overall um, basically found that the Mediterranean diet, which was defined as a diet emphasizing fruits, vegetables, fish, olive oil, and other non-processed non food was the best diet overall. And so it, it got a score of 4.2 out of five, which narrowly beat out the DASH diet. Um, and the, the DASH diet focuses on low salt um, intake for prevention of high blood pressure. And of note, the third one in the list was called a flexitarian diet, which I actually hadn't been as familiar with when I first came across this. Um, although I do have a friend who, who said um, she was a flexitarian, and so it did make me curious a little bit. <laughs> um, but basically, that focuses on fruits and vegetables, whole grains, plant-based proteins, but most of the time. So it's not exclusively vegetarian, and it allows for flexibility when a person, um, you know, actually, I, I do sometimes think I have a family member who says they're vegetarian, but when I sometimes cook with, um, with fish, they will be willing to eat that. And so I think, well, maybe it, not going to mince words, but a flexitarian is, is more aligned with what that is, where um, if someone presents you a meal with fish in it, um, you don't refuse, you know, and I think, I think a flexitarian diet brings a lot of the components that a Mediterranean diet also does. So the Mediterranean diet and flexitarian diet share a lot of um, similarities and it's probably in the um, extent to which a person eats um, meat-based proteins or um, fish and seafood in terms of the differentiation between the Mediterranean and the flexitarian diet. So, um, so basically how they came up with their diet rankings was they had a panel of nationally recognized experts in diet, nutrition, obesity, food psychology, diabetes, and heart disease. And so they rated the diets according to several categories. Um, the ease of following, the impact on short-term and long-term weight loss. So these two items took into account how likely someone is to be successful first at initiating, but also at maintaining the diet, in part because you know, our willingness to continue with dietary changes we might make depends on how much we are already achieving our goals. And in some of those ways, you know, I, I brought up the, the Mediterranean versus the flexitarian. If those feel um, more straightforward, you know, perhaps it feels harder to think about being a mostly vegetarian with, you know, intermittent um, plant or uh, intermittent meat-based or seafood-based protein, but maybe it makes it more straightforward or maybe an easier way to think of it is to do Mediterranean diet that doesn't really talk about, you know, the things we're not going to eat, but focuses on all of the, you know, delicious food that we do have available to us. So 
the ease of following an impact on short-term um, and long-term weight loss really for me is, I think about it as how successful could a person be um, in, in achieving that? The other thing was nutritional completeness, which is particularly important uh, for older adults, which we'll talk about in a moment, as well as safety. So the, um, the panel wanted to make sure that we aren't causing more harm than good with these approaches. So there were some diets um, you know, that they flagged for being not as safe as, um, as others. So then the potential for preventing and managing diabetes and heart disease. So here, um, this is again, looking at that evidence for what, what diets can help reduce the incidence of disease. And this is also consistent with the US dietary guidelines. And so um, the guidelines offer less guidance on what types of food within each of these categories but again, it still does have this focus on um, how to fill a person's plate. So are there fruits and vegetables that take up about half the plate? And are there grains that take up about a quarter um, and then slightly less protein? And so in this way, you know, we really, we can be conceptualizing. And I like, I really like the my plate in terms of how should, you know, I consider my plate um, to look as I'm filling it up. Um, but I think what's important is that we also focus not just on those portions, but we also focus on the quality of the food within those. So for example, the protein, um, what the Mediterranean diet would propose is to have the majority of that protein filled with seafood, nuts, and um, legumes, whereas this doesn't give as much guidance um, on those categories as we've just discussed. So recent research, is also demonstrating that as we age, we, um, we become less active, our metabolism slows, and our energy requirements decrease. There actually was an um, interesting study that was published about in the last six months, and it was really fascinating because there had been a thought that our metabolism you know, is kind of going along and then has certain drops at different ages. Um, I might have been someone who thought that my metabolism was going fine until I, got a, I met a, a severe drop in metabolism. Um, but actually what the data provided, and it was um, an analysis that brought together um, dozens of studies, and it basically looked at our metabolism needs are, are actually declining pretty um, uh, uh, at a steady rate over time. And so um, that is basically telling us that as we get older, we need to consume fewer calories. But at the same time with what we've just been talking about, the importance of eating nutrient dense food increases because if we're eating fewer calories, um, we need to have those be nutrient dense. And then that's increased even more by um, the knowledge that older adults ability to absorb and utilize nutrients can become less efficient over time. So then the nutrient requirements actually increase while the amount of food that we need to eat is decreasing. So taken together, that really encourages us to eat nutrient dense food um, in order to meet the nutrient requirements. And then we also know that as we age, the body is naturally losing muscle, which is um, a phenomenon termed sarcopenia. And you know, this has been characterized across many studies um, and generally impacts both the muscle mass as well as muscle function. So an article in um, the journal Family Practice um, stated that we can think of sarcopenia um, considering what it does for muscles as what we think about osteoporosis is doing for bones. And so um, the sarcopenia being something that we could also so try to mitigate, um, you know, so try to maintain our muscle mass, just like people are trying to maintain um, bone density. So loss of muscle mass is a primary contributor to functional decline in older adults. And so therefore, increasing protein requirements um, in older adulthood in our dietary intake is important to counteract this natural phenomenon of reduced muscle mass over time. And we'll also get back into muscle mass um, and how to prevent muscle loss as we talk about exercise in the next section. But at this point, I wanted to pause and see if people have questions. Um, I will look and see if 
I see anything in the chat. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, DeWitt, do you, can I do a check-in with you and see if there's anything you're seeing at this point? Hi, it's Mariah. Uh, DeWitt Hi. had to step out for oh. a moment, so okay. I'll just jump in, but uh, I do not see anything in the chat at this point either. Okay, thanks. All right, so if other questions or if any questions come up as I continue, I am happy at the end to answer questions about both um, dietary intake and physical activity if, um, if questions come to mind later. But since, oh, let's see, actually, I am seeing something in the chat now. Oh, what about coconut oil? Um, I am I am a fan of coconut oil. So that's a great question. I think that comes um, to the quality of the fat. And so coconut oil, um, I believe, provides some essential fatty acids to our body. And so um, coconut oil is one that I... I enjoy cooking with because I think of it as um, one of the better fats. So um, yeah, does that answer the question? Think about coconut oil. All right, I think that was the only question I saw. So I'm gonna move on to the physical activity recommendations. And you might've noticed that I switched, I talked about exercise and then also, um, physical activity. And so really, we often use the term physical activity um, rather than exercise because of the connotations of exercise. It can mean maybe, you know, exercise has to be done at a gym or is a five mile jog when in reality, physically active, you know, being physically active or physical activity really encompasses sort of any way in which we're moving our body um, to increase our fitness or just you know, physical activity can be undertaken for many, many different reasons. So it, it's, a, in my mind, a broader way of thinking about um, the way we can move our bodies. So physical activity guidelines, the current guidelines, which are, you know, expert consensus on how often and in what ways to move our bodies, um, recommends two and a half hours of physical activity per week, plus um, two days a week of strength training. So this two and a half hours can be comprised of a myriad of activities, um, such as brisk walking or swimming, dancing, golfing. Um, it can be achieved, you know, through yard work, um, through housework. And the strength training can be made up of resistance training or body weight exercises like chair stands, or exercise with a resistance band um, or dumbbells and even dumbbells at low weights, like a two pound dumbbell um, is useful. And so this recommendation is the same for older adults and, um, and adults of any ages. So um, the second edition of the physical activity guidelines um, published by the Department of Health and Human Services provides some specific recommendations for older adults. So we're going to focus on a bit more of what is stated um, in that report. So overall, the recommendations state that we should set a goal of moving more and sitting less. Um, and so the goal of, of two and a half hours per week of physical activity remains true, but it also wants outside of those two and a half hours, there's a lot more hours in the day than just that, that you know, we need to have a, a priority placed on reducing our sedentary time. So you know, I have been um, on Zoom a lot more in the uh, COVID era, and I've been um, really trying to listen to my own advice that even if I have meetings back to back and I don't have a, you know, very large space that I have to walk because I'm just in my house and I'm not commuting to the bus, you know, so even in that scenario, it's good to get up and walk around the room, you know, march in place in between, um, you know, different setting, sitting sessions. Um, and so the recommendation to move more and sit less um, is something that we all um, should take to heart in order for um, achieving optimal health. So the other piece then is alluded, as alluded to earlier, strength training is key um, because as I said before, we all lose muscle as we age, it's really important to try to either 
reverse that or slow that trend. And we can do that through a combination of eating protein rich foods, as well as engaging in strength training. So one thing we're trying to do is prevent the reduction in muscle quality, because as our muscle mass is declining, it's replaced with fat and fibrous tissue, which means that our muscles are no longer producing the same force that they once did. Um, the authors of this guideline make the case that multiple components of physical activity can preserve uh, physical function and mobility, which is allowing us or helping us to maintain independence longer and delaying the onset of major disability. So they further go on to say that physical activity improves physical function in people of any age, including the, those who are overweight or obese, and even those who are frail. So it's essentially advice that it really doesn't matter the underlying um, baseline. Everyone can, if, if able, um, make benefits in their health by trying to move more and sit less and also gain strength training um, or make strength training a part of the exercise. And then for additional benefit, the suggestion is to engage in extra physical activity. So you could really, you could go up to double the amount of two and a half hours per week um, and go all the way up to five hours and see incremental gains um, up to about five hours. That's where it kind of maxes out. So um, it's that's a lot of exercise though. That's basically, um, you know, either five days a week of an hour a day or you know any different combination of that 50 minutes for six days a week. So it's a lot of exercise, but really I think the key here is finding the right physical activity that um, works for you because any physical activity is gonna be um, uh, helpful for maintaining health. And really I think a part of how physical activity can be um, maintained is for it to be something that a person um, looks forward to or enjoys doing and finds the right amount that fits their lifestyle. So finding what works best for you is, is the key. All right, so I'm gonna um, also talk about the physical activity guidelines that are specific. We drill down a little bit more into what those guidelines say for older adults. So the physical activity should be comprised of multiple components as um, we just talked about that includes physical activity. And then also it includes balance training, right? So um, the basically the, um, the strength and aerobic exercises are the ones that build muscle as well as cardiorespiratory fitness. And the balance training is important for um, improving our ability to maintain our balance as we age. So a very important point here is that older adults should determine the level of effort relative to their level of fitness. Um, and the other piece is that understanding how chronic conditions might interplay with physical activity. So um, understanding how those conditions might affect um, the ability to do physical activity safely. And then lastly, um, when two and a half hours of moderate intensity activity is not possible, the suggestion is to be as physically active as, um, as able. And so that's sort of what we were talking about in that last slide is that any physical activity, depending on a person's baseline, is a, um, a good place to start. So the, um, the um, one you know, main guideline is if you have any questions about whether a new physical activity routine is right for you and your specific circumstances, don't hesitate to reach out to your medical provider. And then, you know, as always use common sense. I, I have two intervention studies that I run at the University of Washington currently. And we always tell the study participants that you know, we'd like them to use common sense when they're doing their physical activity with us, because if they feel lightheaded or dizzy at any point, find a place to sit down. Don't resume, you know, the activities until they've gone away. So I think that's good advice overall um, to share. And so um, I guess, you know, why all this focus on physical activity? Well, it is 
important because it makes a difference. Um, the benefits derived from physical activity are widespread and far reaching, as you can see across um, this set of bullet points. So it improves overall health and it also increases fitness. I think um, that's actually one of the one of its main benefits in, and really what I think drives a lot of the improvement in disease reduction is that first and foremost, physical activity improves fitness, which has benefits of its own, which I'll discuss in, um, in just a minute. And so it really has been shown in the research literature to reduce the risk of many chronic conditions, including heart disease, many cancer sites, osteoporosis, um, depression, it reduces the risk of falls, and then also has been um, demonstrated to improve mood. So I said I would drill down into fitness um, and why fitness is so important. And um, what research has shown is that fitness itself reduces the risk of mortality more so than even um, a modest weight gain, preventing a modest weight gain. So there was a study of 14,000 men that they followed for six years that found that even modest increases in fitness, which was um, examined using um, in the study, the maximal exercise stress test, that um, a modest increase in fitness led to a 15% reduction in mortality even after the study investigators accounted for potential impacts of um, changes in body mass index. So it's basically saying if you took two older adults with the same body weight and height, and one of them improved their fitness over six years, that person would have a reduced risk of, of dying more so than the person who did not um, or was not able to improve their fitness. And so to the extent that it is within, um, within your ability to improve fitness, um, it really does have um, benefits. And so to go on a little bit more and describe the benefits of fitness, fitness is a stronger predictor, meaning it can um, help to estimate a person's risk of high blood pressure, smoking. Um, sorry, it, it's a stronger predictor of, of a risk of dying than high blood pressure, smoking, high cholesterol, type two diabetes, or obesity. So it's been called physical. So physical fitness is an area that I focus a lot of my research and it's been called the, um, the next vital sign. So, you know, when you go into a medical provider's office, you are, you know, you're asked, um, to have your blood pressure measured and height and weight, and you're asked, um, to have your heart rate measured. And so the, the thought is that we should really be trying to measure physical fitness in those, as we um, assess the vital signs so that we can help to counsel people on how to improve fitness when it's necessary. So um, fitness is really such a great barometer of health. Um, and so I wanna highlight that physical activity in order to improve our um, fitness, it should be of a moderate intensity on a regular basis. So, Low intensity is more like a person's on a walk and they can easily hold a conversation. And that actually, those are kind of the walks I like to go on, right? But if we're looking to improve our physical fitness, then we would want to kick it up a little bit. And so it would be a walk in which it's harder to hold a conversation. Um, you know, if it gets harder to talk while you're exercising, then that's modern intensity. If you're unable to talk, um, you know, say to a companion while you're exercising, then you're probably more likely jogging. And that's when it's, you can think of it as being um, intense physical activity so, or vigorous physical activity. So getting then to that point back when we said, um, you know, ideally we, we'd exercise 150 minutes a week, which is, we can think of as five times per week for 30 minutes. Really, the goal is to have that 150 minutes of exercise be at the moderate intensity level. And particularly for older adults, then adding strength training is great because some of the research that I've been um, a part of at University of Washington has looked at whether um, the muscle quality that a person has, and, and um, part of that is through strength training. If strength training improves muscle quality and decreases muscle loss, 
then our muscles are better able to meet the demands of exercise. So they're better able to extract oxygen from the blood during exercise. So having that higher functioning muscles allows our body to respond to those increased demands on us and leads to improved fitness. Now, having said that, I also want to say that low intensity um, physical activity is still helpful. So I'm involved with the Women's Health Initiative study, and that study produced um, some, I think, really great information, particularly for older, older adults. So um, this is a decades long study of over 160,000 women um, in the United States and um, across 40 different um, cities and towns that women were recruited from. And so this one had a recent study showing that even low levels of physical activity can improve health and reduce mortality risk. So this study showed that light levels of physical activity, such as taking 3000 steps per day was associated with a 25% reduction in risk of mortality or death. And this study moreover showed that daily life movements. So that was defined as like um, being less, so for example, the household chores of, you know, what's shown here, this woman um, rinsing carrots, right? So um, daily life movements, such as standing while doing household chores or preparing meals is also linked with a reduction in risk of mortality. So the thought was that it's it's potentially because this um, this is taking place taking place um, rather than a person sitting a person is now standing um, and so by reducing the sitting time or sedentary activity and converting that time to standing in which muscles are actively engaged helps to keep our bodies um, fit and and therefore reduces the risk of death so I think. A, um, a take home message here is that any movement counts. So um, some of you also might be thinking, well, this advice is really great, except that my world feels a lot smaller now that I am, um, you know, in month 21 of a, of a COVID pandemic. Um, and so potentially, you know, staying home more and, um, and it's really challenging to implement strength training and aerobic physical activity. But as some of you have probably already discovered and may be aware, there are some great resources available for ways to stay physically active while also staying at home. Um, the AARP has a great series called Get Moving. Um, one example shows how to use resistance bands to strength train um, using your own household items. And another is the Silver Sneaker um, Program. And so, the Silver Sneaker program shows how to be physically active using chair exercises. My mother-in-law um, has been a big fan of both of these and has told me that this has really um, been her go-to for the um, exercise during the pandemic. So, um, and you know, as I mentioned before, chair stands were one of the examples for strength training because we're basically using our own body weight to, um, to strengthen our muscles. So um, there I want to pause and see if anyone has any questions for me. And I'll look to see if the chat has anything. I don't see anything in the chat, but I'm... It doesn't look like we have any questions, but I think people sometimes are a little bit shy in speaking up. So I encourage anyone that might have a question to go ahead and type that in. Um, because if you have a question, I bet somebody else has the same question. Mm -hmm. No one? That's fine. I also, um, I think you might have my email. I can provide my email if people have questions uh, later on. I'd be happy to answer those. Okay. Um, well... I'm gonna give everybody just another quick chance to type any questions in that they might have. Karen, I love that presentation. I've gotten into the habit during the pandemic of taking a walk every single morning, rain or shine, and it does make a huge difference. So when I hear you know, this validation 
yeah. about going for regular walks and getting regular exercise like that. I'm like, ah, oh, yay, I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. Good. Oh, um, good for you. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I I agree. I think um, in the first part of the pandemic, I could really see how much it linked to mood. It was like, oh, I need this daily get out of the house, rain or shine. Yeah. Yep. It gets me out of bed in the morning to take my nice, nice walk. And I get to see all kinds of interesting scenery out and about on my walk. Yeah. Yeah. I um, discovered there was, there's an app that has um, trees of Seattle. So I, my husband and I look for new places to walk and explore and look at the different trees of Seattle. So that's been kind of fun. Oh, that sounds exciting. Maybe I should download that. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, well, folks, if, if we don't have any questions for the moment, we're going to go ahead and, and let Karen go here in a minute. I do want to let you know that we will be emailing out surveys, um, just requesting your feedback. We'd love to know what you thought. Um, and we'd love to know if there are other types of presentations you'd like to see. Um, so if you would fill those out and send those back, that would be fantastic. Um, I do see um, a question that came in. Oh, um, yeah, I think we have time. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, the HIT workout, so the high intensity um, physical activity training, so or high intensity interval training. Um, I think those are great. Um, it's basically a training that can incorporate, you know, rapid bursts of, of um, activity, and then you take a break. And that does maintain an elevated heart rate and can really inc um, increase and improve fitness. So to the extent that they also might include some strength training and maybe even just body weight, but still body weight, um, physical activity is great. So I think that can be somewhat of an all purpose exercise that incorporates both the aerobic and the strength training. So another one that I'm a big fan of. <laughs> I think you brought up coconut oil and hit workouts and I'm thinking, you know, good on both. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, if anyone should have any further questions, uh, feel free to give us a call at Aljoya or email DeWitt. Um, and other than that, I just wish everyone a great day. And Karen, thank you so much for that. That was, it was wonderful. Sorry, my cat. <laughs> now, um, so as far as weightlifting, does lifting a 12 pound cat regularly count? <laughs> it's something. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Take care. Bye now.